come to me here beside the river. Plant yourself beside the river. Each of you, descendant of some past owned traveler, has been paid for. You who gave me my first name. You, Pawnee, Apache, Seneca. You, Cherokee Nation, who rested with me, then forced on bloody feet, left me to the employment of other seekers, desperate for gain, starving for gold. You, the Turk, the Arab, the Swede, the German, the Eskimo, the Scot. You, the Ashanti, the Yoruba, the crew, bought, sold, stolen, arriving on a nightmare, praying for a dream. Here, root yourselves beside me. I am that tree planted by the river which will not be moved. Maya Angelou, a very warm welcome to the program. That moment at the inauguration, how nervous were you? Mm, I was nervous until I began to speak. When I began, I crawled inside the poem. I had to forget that there were four presidents behind me and their wives, and that my son was sitting beside me, and that the Supreme Court judges, and then millions and millions of people all over the world were watching. If I had been cognizant of that, I, I wouldn't have been able to get a word out. So I, I believed that the poem had something to say of such importance that I could crawl into its intent and be safe. And the I intent was a, a plea for tolerance, a plea for equality in For America. peace, yes. For the ability to see each other, to say that uh, human beings are more alike than we are unalike. And let us see that. In, and not only cherish, but, but delight in the differences, because the differences are superficial, and they should delight us. Have you delighted in the Clinton administration I since have, yes, then? Yes, very, very much. In, in him and in, in what he intends to do, in his wife, and what she intends to do, yes. I've been unhappy at the, um, the fact that he's been targeted by so many uh, of his citizens and of his subjects, if you will. But, um, but he's, a, he's a good man, and he's bright, and he's tough-minded. And you're and, happy to be his ambassador in a way, aren't you? I am, very much, yes. Um, I'm an amb ambassador. For, I'd like to be an ambassador for the good things. I'd like to have been Bertrand Russell's ambassador and Mahatma Gandhi's ambassador. Nelson but you'll Mandela. For Clintons. I will be gone. <laughs> Nelson Mandela's ambassador. I would like that, yes. The person who intends to do good. You see, the idea, I mean, that, that anybody is good is foolish. Just foolish. You can't be that one thing all the time. You can intend and try to keep your intent pointed in the right direction. And then when you blow it 400 times in one day, you know, you should have enough courage to forgive yourself and try to start again the next day. Maya Angelou, we should congratulate you because you've just turned 70. Yes. But you never actually thought you were going to even make 30, no, did I didn't. you? Why? I thought I was going to die at about 28. I, I was, um, I don't know, I, I just couldn't imagine 30. I was living very fast. And I, I find that I've lived very fast the subsequent 52 years, too, and uh, 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 42. And I don't seem to be stopping. You wrote a poem about old age, doubt and pessimism, didn't you? coming to you, as you put it, in a Siamese twin embrace. Would you read that yes. section for us? Sure. The loss of love and youth and fire came raiding, riding, a horde of plunderers on one caparisoned steed, sucking up the sun drops, trampling the green shoots of my carefully planted years. The evidence, thickened waist and leathery thighs, which triumph over my fallen insouciance, 
After 55, the arena has changed. I must enlist new warriors. My resistance, once natural as raised voices, importunes in the dark. Is this battle worth the candle? Is this war worth the wage? May I not greet age without a grouse, allowing the truly young to own the stage? It would be nice if I did, but I still <laughs> stay out there. There's a bit of a grouse still, is there? But I don't, no, no grouse. It's just that I'm out there doing it. I have not pulled back. And the, there seems to be something in me that does not want to pull back. So I'm still in the arena. At 70, you say your optimism has returned. It departed a little at the age of 60, but optimism and, and sensuality, a kind of lustiness you talk about, has that really returned? Yes, of course. You're enjoying life more? Uh, oh, You're enjoying yes, sensuality more? Very much. Very much. I, I uh, don't mean to imply that an evening with, uh, with a man of my choice is, uh, can be enjoyed as frequently as uh, a delightful walk on the hill in San Francisco or a walk through the serpentine, you know, on a nice day or a really boiling hot pot of tea or you know, some it's great music. It's all a part of it. And the very idea that uh, at 50, well, okay, it's all over but the shouting. Oh, please. I have a poem. It's really a piece of doggerel of my mother. It's called uh, Mrs. V.B. She says, ships, yes, I'll sail them. Show me the boat. If it'll float, I'll sail it. Men, yes, I'll love them. If they have the style to make me smile, I'll love them. Life, yes, I'll live it. Just give me breath up to my death and I'll live it. <laughs> failure, I'm not ashamed to tell it. I never learned to spell it, not failure. <laughs> Lovely. Maya Angelou, you were born Marguerite Johnson yes. in St. Louis, Missouri, and you were packed off by train with a little label attached to you to Stamps, Arkansas, to your grandparents, to live in some poverty, wasn't it? Well, I don't think it was, it was poverty time. We, we, my grandmother owned the only black-owned store in the town. And um, she, she was such a tradeswoman. She never knew it. She'd never gone outside of Arkansas, but she was really a West African tradeswoman, in truth. So she would trade the goods we had in the store with the poor people, I mean, really poor, so that they could, they ate things like, oh, mackerel, Thick, exotic things like, like canned sardines and things, while we ate uh, turnips, <laughs> which she had bartered. Uh, poverty, the place was dirt poor, the town was dirt poor, and it was the 30s. Dirt poor, segregation. Oh, absolute. Depression. Yes, all over the country. But you, you know, American, African American jokers say that. Depression had hit the United States for 10 years before black people even knew it. I mean, we were already in such condition. You saw discrimination, yes. didn't you, when your mother went to court on one occasion and the judge was actually criticized or people thought the judge had made a gaffe because he called a Negro woman Mrs. I know. Did that shock you? Of course. That's vulgar. You see, the, the difference, Mr. Sebastian, and I think it comes as a shock to some British and maybe English in particular uh, interviewers, is that I have no bitterness. None. None. Why? Well, bitterness is like, uh, like cancer. It eats upon the host. It doesn't do a damn thing to the object. It can eat the host to death, you see? What I have is a readiness to rage. I'm, if I see injustice anywhere. And to I'm channel, to channel your rage? Absolutely. I speak up, I do something about it. But I don't harbor 
and nurture a little kernel of bitterness. Oh no, I know it will eat me up. And I'm here to stay. I'm here to, to be present right up to the very end. People could forgive you, couldn't they, for being bitter, particularly with some of the experiences that you suffered. I'm thinking of the rape, mm -hmm. when you were raped at but the age of eight. Forgive me? Nobody. Only I can forgive myself. I don't, people can't forgive me for bitterness. They might think they understand it. They might be able to comprehend the cause and effect. But um, if I was a bitter person, no one else can forgive me for that. They might embrace me and feel sorry for me. Ooh. But that wouldn't help me, because the bitterness would be chomping down on my liver, on my guts, and <laughs> I won't have it. Thinking back to that terrible experience yeah. at the age of eight, aren't, aren't you bitter? How could such a thing have happened to you? You were raped by your mother's lover, weren't yeah. you? Yes, uh, not bitterness. Maybe we're uh, using the wrong words. Angry, yes. Um, the, um, around the world, I try to be present in the prevention of cruelty to children. So one of the, the latest facility in Britain, in London, built for the prevention of cruelty to children, was named for me four years ago. It's in Haringey. I worked very hard. In North London? In North London, to um, around the world, to put a stop to that sort of cruelty. Because of what you experienced? Yeah, that's, I'm sure that's part of it, but a lot of people work in that field who have never suffered that. So it's colored your life? It has, in, it has enriched my life, yes. Which is a remarkable thing to say. It, it has, it's true. I mean, I wouldn't say, you know, any person should be raped and there, thereby uh, her, his life will be enriched. That's like saying all grass is green, subsequent everything that's green is grass. So I don't mean that. But if, if the awful thing befalls you, it is a wise thing to try to take that and open it up and make it of use. So that uh, the writer says, if you get a lemon, make lemonade. You know, why hang about uh, milk, all that stuff, and just make a bore of yourself? My Angelou, you were 17, I believe, when your son was born. Yes. And you kept this secret from your parents. Yes, I was 16. How, how was that possible? I, my mother was up in Alaska after I was about three months pregnant. Um, my dad, my stepdad, used to say, oh, you're coming to look just like a young woman. And I used to think I should. I'm five months pregnant. But I wanted to go to school. My brother told me I had to finish school. I had to. He said, if you don't finish high school, you will never go back. So at least get high school. I mean, finish, the, get the, that diploma. Then after, you can go to college. Um, so um, I just didn't tell until a few weeks before. My mother came down and looked at me. I had left a note for my stepdad saying I was going to have a baby in three weeks. He misunderstood. Quite a message. And so I told my mother on the phone, she's three weeks pregnant. So my mother zapped down to San Francisco, and she was a very sporty lady. She came and she said, hi, baby. She said, you're more than any three weeks pregnant. I said, it's about two and a half weeks now. <laughs> but, but she was brilliant. She said, she asked me if I loved the boy. I said, no. She asked, did he love me? me. I said, no. She said, well, there's no point in ruining three lives. No. So we have a baby. We have a baby. A baby who's gone on to be the joy of your life. He is a great man. He's a great man. He's head of personnel for the city of Oakland, California, with its two million. He's got a new book coming out, which Random House thinks is the bee's knees. They've given him an advance. I had to write 10 books before I could get that. <laughs> But you've been through some bad times with him, haven't you? In Ghana, yeah, in the road I've accident there. Mm -hmm. And you actually gave a very vivid description of seeing him with blood on his mm -hmm. face and yeah. blood on his gun. How, how did you cope with that? Because this was an enormous shock to you, wasn't yes. it? Yes. 
Well, Ron Cope, I, you, you ask me questions, you make me sound like I'm really some big muckety muck. So, I'm, human beings cope. We do that. I'm not. Uh, A lot don't. Well, that's true. I'm sorry for that. But people are really much greater than they think themselves. We really are. My Angelo, you seem to have an enormous capacity to give love. You've loved a lot of people. Has love been good to you oh, over yes. the years? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've lost it. I've yearned for it. I've been disappointed. But uh, it puts uh, starch in my backbone, spring in my step. Yes. Very and the mischievous glint in your eyes we saw on the front <laughs> the page of your book. Yes. Which man has done most for ah, you? Ah, now. I, I can't single out a particular man. As a, a partner man, there have been men who've been brothers to me. And, of course, my son, my grandson. But lovers and uh, husbands and... No, no. In their time, each was, was fabulous in his time. But for all your talk of sexuality yes. and sensuality, it's the mind that you've of course. got most, isn't it? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Uh, men, I forget how men look sometimes if they, if they really are bright and funny. And so I married one man once. He was a he was a walking encyclopedia, and also funny. And so um, my girlfriends, my sister friends, still do. If I'm around in a group and a man is scintillating, my friends say, Maya, watch it, watch it. <laughs> so this man, I married him. We came to London for a honeymoon. We came back to the States. He was a stoutly man, stout, portly. And I went over to Brooklyn to the house where I used to live I, to get some papers. So I introduced my husband to the former landlady. She said, oh, yes, come, I have your papers. I went with her in the back. She said, he fat, ain't he? I said, he is not. I said, he's portly. Love is blind. I went back into the living room. That man was huge. <laughs> and, but I loved him. What was this talk of prostitution? Ah, oh, that was when I was 18. We had met two women who were prostitutes, and they were trying to, to inveigle me into it. So I said, no, I won't do it, but if you have, want to... I can arrange for you to have a place and you can do it yourself and I'll just take some of the money. So I got a man. To, <laughs> it's 18, I mean. A madam at 18. Yeah, well, that sounds like it. You I also made, in the, in, in the 50s, you made what you called a decent living as a, as a nightclub singer. Oh, I made it. Very nice. Do you living. enjoy it? I love to sing. I don't like to sing uh, in, in, on the stage. I speak on the stage, but singing, I never loved it, so I never had a chance to become great at it. And acting? Acting, I'm, I'm pretty good. You were in good. Blacks, weren't you? I was in the Blacks. Which was important. And I wrote the music for it. Tell me about Billie Holiday. Miss Billie. Holiday. <laughs> you were quite daunted about I her was. coming to your house, weren't I you? I know. She was known to curse so badly, and that's not one of my arts. I mean, I have the odd, you know, expletive. But uh, to, really, to really curse, I don't do that. Um, she cursed at your son, didn't she? She cursed. But she had been so sweet to him for a week. And then he asked her something, and she cursed. And he was really angry with me. So it took us about a month to get over. He, I don't know, he was about 10. And I think he thought I should have put her out. Maybe I should have. She came and saw you sing, didn't she? Yes. What was her verdict? She, well, she had told me before. <laughs> she, 
She said, you're never going to be a great singer. She said, but you're going to be great, but never as a singer. But, um, and, but that night when I sang, I sang an old-fashioned blues, uh, almost rubato. Well, it was rubato and almost a cappella. The blues was, baby, please don't go. Baby, please don't go. And she was sitting at a table with her little Pekingese, not a Pek, a uh, Chihuahua, who was drinking her drink with her. When, when I started singing, she screamed, shut that up, shut up, shut up. You sound like my mother. And ran into the, ba- into the toilet <laughs> in the middle of and everybody was looking at Miss Billie Holiday. I mean, it was, uh, as the kids say, gross. You were quite an activist in your time for black rights. You met Martin Luther King. Yes. You knew him reasonably well. Tell me about that first meeting, because you walked in, and he complimented you on being punctual, didn't yes. he? Yes, but he, he had turned, he had, well, he was in a swivel chair, and I was working as uh, his northern representative. And he was, I just walked into my office and suddenly he turned. And of course it just shocked me. And he looked, he reminded me of my brother, of Bailey, very much, and looked in size. In was size. it exciting? Oh, it was thrilling. Your heart in your throat? <laughs> yes, heart and throat. The focus was the Harlem Writers Guild at that time, yes, wasn't it? Yes. Was that a melting pot of ideas? Was it, was it militant? Were you militant? Yes, of course time? I was militant. At some time, I mean, young people should be militant. Goodness gracious. Um, is it Thoreau who said, in evil times, the only place for a good man is exile or jail? Yes, I was militant. Is that the way it felt? Yes, I mean, one had to be engaged. You, you can't sit by and watch uh, uh, evil on the throne and good dash to earth and not say something. Maya Angelou, you fell in love with Africa yes. when you were there, but you don't like the term African-American in a way, do you? You yes. prefer black American? Well, it's easier. It's just fewer syllables. <laughs> oh, but they're, they're equally ex- they're exchangeable. African-American, black American, Afro-American. Um, the, over the centuries, uh, African Americans were called everything, everything, Dan, Spot, Spade, Coon, Nigger, Jigaboo. You've been asking yourself what, what Africa is to you, and you've done it far more eloquently than I can in your latest book, Even the Stars Look Lonesome. I wonder if you'd read that passage to us. Oh, from the, yes. This is from a poem by... County Cullen, called Heritage. What is Africa to me? Copper sun or scarlet sea? Jungle star or jungle track? Strong bronzed men or regal black women from whose loins I sprang when the birds of Eden sang? One three centuries removed from the scenes his father's love. Spicy grove, cinnamon trees. What is Africa to me? Still asking the question? Yes. Still loving it, too. <laughs> but you write with a Bible mm-hmm. next to you, don't you? Yes. You also write with a glass of sherry. Yeah, a bottle. A sherry. bottle. <laughs> 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 a, a, a Bible, Roger's Thesaurus, a good dictionary, and a bottle of sherry which helps you get through because you've talked about the value of always being knocked down but being able to get up right. and go on. Absolutely. Each one of us who is able to, in the morning, rises, makes his or her ablutions, sees another human being and says, Morning, how are you? Fine, thanks, and you? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. Wherever that is in the human spirit, whether it's behind the kneecap or in the bend of the elbow, there is the nobleness of the human spirit. Maya Angelou, it's been a great pleasure having you on Hard Talk. Thank, Thank you very you. much Thank indeed. Thank you very much, Mr. Thank you. Sebastian. And I like your eyes. Mm-hmm.